hello and good afternoon to, to everyone joined. Um, thank you for giving up um, what I'm sure is part of your lunch hour to, to um, go through a very exciting topic of, of data protection and, and crucially why it's so important in the education um, education sector. There's lots of um, talk, lots of resources out there. Um, what we've tried to do with this webinar is really condense that and, 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 and get to the the crux of issues that are at the heart of complying with this regulation for education. Now, we only have a half hour of presenting, so there is only so much that we can squeeze in. Um, but as Sheree rightly said, please feel free to um, throw your questions in the, in the Q&A. And we do have time scheduled for, for questions and answers towards the end of the presentation. And um, I will see if I can answer questions as we go throughout as well. Uh, so my name is Joseph Corns. I'm a data protection consultant with an organization called CyberCraft who are a data protection and cyber security consultancy. Um, and we, we partner with Softcat to, to offer our products and services um, to the wider market. And on this slide here, I'm going to show you some of the key elements that we're going through um, to, throughout this presentation. And um, I'm sure there's people on the line who are at various stages through their, their GDPR um, project, whether they're just starting out, looking to get some information, or, or quite close to completion and, uh, and getting to that, that holy grail of GDPR compliance. And, and GDPR compliance is, is very very difficult to achieve, partly because 100% um, compliance doesn't really exist. You know, and compliance looks different for every organisation. Um, it's a question of, of demonstrating accountability and, and fairness and transparency. And we'll, we'll dig into that in a, in a little bit more detail. But specifically, well, we've we've taken out key points for for this presentation. Um, you can see there. So we'll, we'll touch on the lawful basis to process personal data. Every organisation needs a lawful basis to process personal data before before they go ahead and do it. And we'll We'll explore what that looks like in, in the education sector. Fairness and transparency is such a crucial element of the GDPR um, and complying with any data protection regulation, you know, telling people what you're doing with their, with their data um, when, when you get it. Looking at your processing systems as well, um, processing systems are could be anything from filing cabinets to cloud storage providers, uh, cloud software providers, platform as a service providers. Um, we'll dig into those in a bit more detail. Um, you can't do everything yourselves, so you naturally need to have the third parties helping you. Um, but exchanging personal data with third parties, having that, that trade-off of personal data with third parties, has some compliance implications, so we'll dig into that uh, in a little bit more detail as well. Fundamentally, um, data protection and, and GDPR is a risk balancing exercise. We have to take a risk-based approach, and we'll look at how we can we can use risk assessments and data protection impact assessments, or DPIAs, um, to the best of our abilities. Social media is, is quite a new one um, in, the, in the data protection realm, but so so important. Um, with social media, we're, we're less focused on um, what students are posting, um, but more what schools are posting, what educational institutions are posting, um, what personal data is. In a photograph, for example, and how what, what are the potential impacts on that. A retention of data, always a fun topic, and then finally we'll close off by talking about data protection officers, the requirement for them, um, and where they're, they're most needed. Um, so let's get going. And like I say, there's people on this webinar guaranteed with, with um, various uh, degrees of knowledge of, of the regulation. Um, so in this first element, I'm just going to have a, a, bit of a, a bit of a crash course on what the GDPR is. I've just seen a question come through saying, um, will the presentation be available to download afterwards? And we will make the slides available as well. So um, no need to scribble down notes, although I'm sure there'll be some points that'll be fairly interesting for you as well. So. What is the GDPR? Well, fundamentally, it's a regulation that protects people's right to privacy. Right? Everybody has a right to privacy, and their own personal data um, should be protected. And what, that's what the GDPR is designed to do, designed to protect that, that right to privacy, which is a fundamental right. You often hear when people are talking about data protection and the GDPR um, is protecting the fundamental rights and freedoms of individuals, of data subjects. Um, it absolutely replaces the Data Protection Act of 1998, which came in through the Data Protection Directive from the European Union, um, which was, if there's any legally minded people on, on, on the webinar, uh, you'll know there's two types of laws that can come out of Europe. We've got directives and regulations. Directives are um, when the European Union says, well, look, here's some guidelines around what you need to do, say, for example, data protection, um, and then it's up to the member states to create their own laws, which is why we have the Data Protection Act. And, and different versions of the Data Protection Acts 
um, across Europe. Uh, what the GDPR is designed to do is harmonise all those data protection regulations, those data protection acts into one, one single regulation. Uh, regulation goes into, uh, into um, force uh, as it's written for, uh, for every EU member state. It is a European regulation, but it's got an extremely global scope as well. So it covers any international organisation processing personal data um, that's collected in the EU. Um, it is only concerned with personal data, and we'll dig into what we mean by personal data in a little bit. And it is designed so that controllers, data controllers, data processors, some definitions we'll go into in a little bit, um, can demonstrate accountability and transparency for their, for their data, the personal data they process. And it's not necessarily a burden for organisations. I see a lot of um, talk around and, and you know, is uh, GDPR is going to be um, a, a big burden, it's, you know, a lot of resource, a lot of time, a lot of effort. But once you've got data protection done well, you, you tend to find you have more streamlined business practices. Um, you can get the most out of the data you have on top of knowing you're handling it in a compliant manner. So up on this slide here, I've got some key terms that I'll be using throughout, and it's very it's beneficial to know them for this webinar, but also if you're talking to anybody else around data protection as well. So there's an idea that organizations represent uh, one of two things. They can hold one of two roles. It's data controller or data processor. And a data controller is an organization that will exercise autonomy over data. They'll determine the means and the purpose. Um, a nice simple example I like to use is you know, if I've got a list of customers and I've got their names and email addresses um, and I want to market to the customers via email, um, I'm the data controller because I'm determining um, what, what to do with that data. And I as a data controller can undertake that activity myself. Um, and that will just be a processing activity that I do as the data controller. You can see there the definition of processing is any operation performed on personal data. Um, or I could outsource that to a specialist marketing agency, and I'll say, hi, marketing agency, here's my list of customers, here's their email addresses, can you market to them via email? Um, and in that situation, that marketing agency is a data processor, because a data processor can only do with data um, what the data controller says. Um, the, that relationship is always governed by contract, and we'll dig into that with third parties. Data subjects are any people that we process personal data of, um, legal entities, inanimate objects, and not considered data subjects. They have to refer to a human being, a person. And finally, the definition of personal data is extremely expansive. It's any information we could use to uh, identify someone either directly or indirectly. Um, so that brings into scope things like online identifiers, like um, email, like um, IP addresses and cookie information. Um, you could even argue that number plates are, are personal data as well because someone could identify them. So understanding your personal data is a key scope, key in understanding your scope for compliance. But, but bear in mind that definition of personal data is extremely wide. Um, within personal data, we've got the creation of standard categories and special categories. Now, this standard category list is um, not limited to everything you can see on there. Um, it almost goes on infinitely. Um, but the special category data is a, a defined list, and everything you see there is considered to be a special category of personal data. And as well as having a lawful basis, we'll have to have an appropriate exemption to process this type of data. So if we take that risk balance approach to, to the GDPR and data protection, absolutely have a look at where you're processing this type of personal data um, and see what security measures you can place around it. Obviously, a lot of this is key um, for educational institutions. Uh, GDPR data protection regulation is uh, made up of core philosophies and, and principles, and the GDPR is guided by these six principles here. So lawfulness, fairness, and transparency we're going to dig into. Um, number two, we collect data for a specific purpose, purpose limitation. If we collect data for one reason, we don't then use it for another. Um, Principle number three is around data minimization. So we only collect and we only process the personal data that we need to. We don't collect data excessively. And you know, taking that risk approach, the more data we have, the more risk we're putting ourselves at. Uh, principle number four uh, is always an interesting one. All the personal data we process at all times should be accurate and up to date. Uh, principle number five, we should only keep data for as long as necessary, looking at retention periods. 
And finally, principle number six, we should process personal data in a manner that ensures its security. Now, for those that don't know, information security is built around a few core principles, and that's um, the, the CIA model, uh, confidentiality, integrity, availability. Um, so confidentiality, only the people need to access data, can access data. Integrity, uh, the data is whole in parts, and um, finally, uh, there is um, the idea of availability, that the information is always available to us when we need it. Um, there isn't uh, a new concept that's brought in with the GDPR of resilience, and resilience is, um, is, is how we retrieve data if it was ever to go missing at all. So say we left a file on a train, how do we bring that back again? Um, I just had something come through on the chat saying that the someone's having difficulty with audio connection, so I just want to make sure everybody can hear me. Sheree, uh, is my audio coming through okay? Hi, Joseph. Yeah, everyone, I think their audio problems have been resolved. I've been um, helping them as requests have come through. Fantastic. Good stuff. Always beneficial when you can hear the webinar. Um, and finally, we've got this uh, idea of accountability. And accountability is um, what I like to call as a, as a floating seventh principle. It's not in the core six, but is a key element of, of the regulation. And accountability is how we demonstrate compliance with the GDPR. And what accountability ultimately comes down to is, is what you can prove. Okay? Can you prove that your data is encrypted? Can you prove that you've issued privacy notices? Can you prove that you've got processes for handling subject access requests? Have you documented your re your or re recorded your processing activity? Can you prove that you're compliant with the regulation? Because that's what the GDPR is designed to do. It's designed to um, force the burden of proof on organizations um, rather than the regulator trying to, to say, um, oh, you're not compliant here, you're not compliant there. What they'll generally say is, well, demonstrate to us that you are compliant, and that's showing accountability. Data subjects, so you, me, everybody in the UK and Europe and even the world, uh, any person we process personal data on, um, if we're bound by the GDPR, they, they have these rights here. The right to information, as you can see, generally comes in the form of privacy notices, going back to that fairness and transparency principle. The right of access, you may already be familiar with, the subject access requests. Um, similar to this is freedom of information requests, if you're, if you're bound by them. Not exactly the same, but in a similar vein. Um, the right to object, the right, and the right to erasure, and the right to restrict processing. Qualified rights, so you know if you've got overriding lawful basis to process that data, you don't necessarily have to respond to those. The right of erasure yeah, is, is one of the new rights under the, the, the data protection regulation, the GDPR. Um, and the right to data portability is moving data from one controller to another controller or data processor. And it's designed so people don't get locked into services because they can't get their personal data out. So we spoke about lawfulness of processing, well I spoke about lawfulness of processing, so what does that actually mean? Well, as I say, every organization needs a lawful basis to process personal data, and the GDPR defines six lawful grounds for processing personal data, and you can see those bullet points on the left there. Now, consent is often said is, is, is the golden ticket, but consent comes with a few requirements, and, and, and if we're using consent as a lawful basis to process personal data, we have to meet the conditions for consent. So one of those conditions for consent is that it, it needs to be uh, freely given um, through an affirmative action, has to be unambiguous, and it has to be, be able to be withdrawn. Okay, so if we are offering the consent, we have to be able to offer the option to withdraw consent. Um, so if you are relying on consent and someone withdraws their consent, how is that going to impact your process? Okay, is there another, another lawful basis that is more appropriate? And more often than not, there is. Um, contractual obligations and legitimate interests are, are some of the most common that we see in the education sector. Now, particularly for, for um, private education, um, they, those, those types of institutions enter into a, a, almost an educational contract to say, yes, you will uh, attend our, our school, um, and this is how, what we're going to use your data for, and this is the service we're going to provide you. And um, in a lot of educational institutions, it's, it's very much the same. And you can use this contractual obligation, this, this, contractual, um, this contractual clause of education, as a lawful basis to process personal data, because you know, if they attend the school, you'll need to process the personal data. But we'll have to say what those, those um, processes, is, uh, processes are. Excuse me. Legitimate interest is an interesting one, and um, legitimate interest, well, the GDPR says public 
sector organisations can't use legitimate interests as a uh, lawful basis to process, but in the current version of the UK's Data Protection Bill, um, organisations can, and the ICO have confirmed that the public sector organisations can use their legitimate interests um, as a lawful basis to process personal data. Um, the difficulty with the legitimate interests is that we have to say what those legitimate interests are to the data subject. We have to inform them of, of those leg legitimate interests. And those legitimate interests can't negatively affect the, um, the data subject's fundamental rights and freedoms. So uh, things like profiling, it's very difficult to use your legitimate interests to process someone's um, personal data to, to profile them. Um, it's often in the vital interest to, to process someone's personal data, and vital interest really comes down to if you're going to save their life. So if a student, a pupil, has a, an ongoing medical condition that requires them to um, take, take medication on a periodic basis, um, without which they will, they will suffer, then you could potentially use the vital interest um, legal obligation there. But it really has to come down to if you're going to save their life. And the exemptions, we spoke about special category data. Uh, we've got exemptions to, to processing special category data, primarily because um, the GDPR says we can't do it unless we meet one of these exemptions. So explicit consent is a, is a very one, good one to get. Um, employment rights or obligations, so think about for staff, you've got um, occupational health, um, health and well-being of, of your staff members and maybe um, under your employment rights that you can process their data, uh, their, their special category data, and we've got vital interest as well, again, if we're going to save their life. A lot of information in this slide, as I say, the, the, the slides will be available and I've just seen there'll be a recording of the webinar available to those attendees as well. Um, so we spoke about fairness and transparency, going back to that principle number one, lawfulness, fairness and transparency. and Fairness and transparency is, is what I like to call the information exchange. So if I provide you with my personal data, I expect information on how you're going to use that data. All right, and the GDPR, Article 13, if you'd like to do some outside reading, um, dictates what we should include in the uh, privacy notices and this, this fairness and transparency documents that we provide data subjects when we collect information from them. And you can see that there. And the, what, you have to think, when's the most appropriate time to provi provide this information? Is it when we are, when a pupil is, is uh, going through the enrollment process um, for, for the school? Is it before then, um, when, when you know, they're thinking about joining, maybe attend an interview? We'll be processing their personal data then, so we should be providing some information. Processing systems, as I say, there's, there's a wide range of processing systems that, that help the education sector, and I don't have a slide deck big enough to list all of them, so I've tried to, to summarize them here. So education management, curriculum tools, um, you know, time and attendance um, systems, um, there's a variety that can be used to, to, to help you in, in, in delivering your, 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 your educational services to, to pupils, and, and that could include clan applications like Office 365, Google is, is, I know, quite heavily used in the education sector because it's, it's cloud-based. You can email homework out to people. You can collect it very easy as well. Um, you've naturally got safeguarding obligations um, being an educational institution, and some of those safeguarding systems could contain special category data um, for, for, for pupils. So who's got access to that? Where is it? You notice I've put that who, what, where, when, why. It's crucial to, to hear that confidentiality point of information security to understand, well, who can access it and, and why do they need to access it? What are they going to be doing with those tools? GDPR not, doesn't just cover digital documents, it covers physical documents as well. So how are you securing filing cabinets, for example? Where are your physical storage locations for documents? Um, what's your retention period around that? How are you mapping it, auditing it, and ultimately showing that accountability level um, for your processing systems? Um, one of the f first things that we advise uh, customers is to understand their scope for compliance, and to do that, we look at where personal data is, where does it exist, what systems do it, does it exist in, and once you understand that, you can begin to shape your compliance program. Again, take that risk-based approach, look at the sensitive data, and apply more, more security, more technical, more organizational measures to it. You may have a range of third parties that help you um, in, in your day-to-day -day operations, and we've mentioned cloud service providers. They are third-party data processors. 
Um, the, the relationship between data controllers and data processors has to be governed by a, a contractual agreement of some sort. Um, there's ICO, I've released consultation guidance, we've got the link there, um, so you can go and visit that page. There's also a, a fair few law firms that have issued guidance on what should be in a controller, data controller, data processor contract as well. Um, so have a look at that and make sure any organization that you're sharing personal data with is bound by an appropriate agreement. Um, Medical professionals are a common occurrence within uh, within schools, within educational institutions, primarily because not all of the time there's a, there's a, a full-time medical professional. Sometimes they'll be contracted out to an organization. Again, a third-party data processor. Um, if it's the NHS, then yeah, fantastic, public sector, but still a third party that is um, receiving personal data that you're sharing. So be aware of your third parties, try and map them and, and document them to a degree and make sure they're bound by an, an appropriate uh, contractual agreement. School trips are always an interesting one too because if you're taking personal data outside of the European economic area, well then you could be sending it to a, what, what we deem as a third country. And um, for that third country data transfer, we'll need appropriate safeguards or, or potentially use of derogations as well. The risk-based approach is the best way to approach GDPR compliance because you can see, well, you know, we are very strong in this area, but this area where we're storing our medical information, where we're trying to uh, store our, our safeguarding information for, for our students, then, well, that's potential risk. Is it a risk because there's too much access to it, it's stored on a third party servers, it's not encrypted, um, it's in paper format, and if it goes, we don't have the ability to bring it back. And there's all these uh, risks associated with data sets and data processes. Uh, measuring risks and being accountable for the risks you take is a key part of um, demonstrating compliance with the GDPR. And when we're looking at risk, we should always take the perspective of, 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 um, um, of risks to the data subject. So we, yes, there are risks to an organization, risk in fines, monetary penalties, um, but if we lose someone's uh, name, address, bank details, um, photocopy of their passport, well, you know, that's enough information to, to commit identity fraud. And although that might not be a significant impact on an organization, the, the impact in the, in the individual is, is significant. So we have to look on, on that balance approach, look at the risks to the individual rather than risks to, to an organization. You might have heard of the term of privacy impact assessments under the Data Protection Act. The GDPR refers to them as, as data protection impact assessments, and they should be conducted whenever a data process is likely to result in a high risk um, to, to individuals. So if you've got uh, already a, a methodology for a, undertaking a privacy impact assessment, um, then you can adapt that to, to see the data protection impact assessment guidelines. Now, the uh, Article 29 Working Party, who are a European organization, have issued guidance on, on undertaking a data protection impact assessment. Um, so I'd recommend you, you do take a look at that. And even if you don't believe a, a processing activity is likely to result in a high risk to rights and freedoms of individuals, um, some sort of data risk assessment is, is better than none. So think about your risk assessment culture, uh, what you've got at the moment, and how you can tailor that to um, your pupil data, your staff data, um, and, and your particular high-risk processing activities. Social media is, is, is always an interesting one, and as I say, we're taking this from the perspective of, of schools and educational institutions. It's become more and more prevalent for, for any organization to be on social media to have that social media exposure. But consider what lawful basis are you using to, to promote on social media? If you've got um, an image of a sports team and they've just won a, a county cup, well, that's fantastic news and you absolutely want to share it. But there are, there's personal data in that image, and the, the personal data being the image of the student. Now, we have to take a, a risk-based approach. You know, is it a significant risk? Well, m maybe not, but we'll have to be cautious. We ha always have to have that lawful basis. Is it in our legitimate interest? Would we want to obtain consent for, for putting on social media? How are we going to balance that? How are you being fair and transparent? with that as well. Are you telling your pupils, telling the parents of pupils um, or, or of your intention to post on social media? And how will this impact their, their fundamental rights and freedoms? You know, if, they, uh, if you post using your legitimate interest, uh, 
um, but somebody objects to, to you, their image being on social media, um, then that, that could have a potential um, impact to, to their fundamental rights and freedoms. And the method by which you, you post information onto social media always needs to be considered. Are you using school devices or are teachers contractors, you know, anyone who helps you with your your day-to-day -day, um, operations, put, taking that, those images on their personal devices and then uploading them to, to the social media accounts they've got logins to, you know, that raises the question of bring your own device, what are your policies and procedures around that. So always be careful when you're sharing information on, on social media as well. Um, just because particularly for for um, educational institutes, the in, institutions that operate in the um, lower age brackets, there can be significant risks to, to individuals. And you might have to capture consent and again a, 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 a rule around consent with respect to data protection is that any child with, under the age of 13 cannot give their consent. You have to obtain the consent of the parent. So consider how you'll, you'll, um, you'll, you'll tackle that issue. Storage limitation, this idea of keeping data for as long as necessary um, is, is uh, interesting because from what we found, not just in education, but from most organizations we speak to, um, we hold on to data because we might need it at some point in the future, even though the, the true necessity of holding that data might have, might have expired, that time length might have expired. So, how do we justify how long is necessary? Because that's what the GDPR says. We should we should process personal data for as long as necessary for the processing activity. So what is the processing activity? Well, if it's the length of the time a, a student, a pupil is with you, then we could use that potentially. But what compliance obligations have we got off the back of that as well? Do we have to ensure that we can retain data for a certain amount of years beyond that? Um, is there a need to store data longer than that because there's been an incident or an accident which could be up to 30 years? Do we store it for the age of the, the, a child or a pupil matures, so turns 18? So all these different variances come into play when we're looking at storage and, and the retention of data. And generally the retention of data changes depending on the processing activity. Again, your staff data, your, the retention of staff data um, may be different to that of pupils. So how how long will, be able, will you be able to justify storing data for? Because that's what it comes down to, it's showing accountability for your decision to, to store data and, and, and that ultimately comes down to, to your documents, your risk assessments, how long can you, can you justify, how long can you prove that you're, you're storing data for? And it's one thing having a retention schedule um, and it's another thing uh, ensuring it's adhered to as well. So think about key people who will help you in um, ensuring your policies, procedures um, are, are adhered to. Often we find the best way is to create a, a steering group or a working party um, of, of key stakeholders or interested parties with respect to data protection and they can talk about you know, what retention periods are, are in place as well as any other data protection initiatives and strategies that you're looking to undertake. And often that's led by a champion and, and more often than not that's a, a data protection officer. You may already know this, but a, a data protection officer is required if an organization is a public authority or if you process um, on a large scale special category data as part of your core activities or you undertake the systematic monitoring or profiling um, of, of individuals, of data subjects um, on a large scale as part of your activities. So for, for schools, educational institutes in the public sector, um, you, you, you're required to have a data protection officer. And from what we've seen, a lot of local governments, a lot of local councils are providing data protection officer services. So that will be one data protection officer to many educational institutes, which is absolutely allowed under the GDPR. You can have one data protection officer for multiple institutions, um, providing they've got line of sight visibility and, and um, are, are contactable to any of those organizations as well. Now, if you're a, an educational institution that's not in the public sector, um, then, then you may not need a data protection officer. But if we look at that systematic monitoring or profiling of data subjects, well, you know, part of uh, education is testing. Okay, and we look at test scores, we look at test results, and we make conclusions from them, you know, what particular set to put um, a student in or a pupil in or, or what course we think will be best for them. Does that under, um, count as profiling? Well, potentially, 
potentially. So you might want to consider a data protection officer in that respect as well. The data protection officer's role is, is very much a compliance role. So as part of their uh, avoidance of conflict of interest, they can't have an operational role. So they can't be processing personal data on a day-to-day -day basis um, or, or, or be key in, the, in an organization's operations. So that rules out um, head teachers, um, deputy teachers, uh, anyone in IT, HR, finance even. So you, you have to have that compliance role that almost sits in isolation and can look at, yes, your compliance with data protection regulations, but also other things as well, like freedom of information requests, um, like uh, any other safeguarding obligations you might have, um, safeguarding compliance obligations, you know, maybe some due diligence on third parties as well. So consider how you look to deploy that DPO. And if you just decide that you don't need a data protection officer, that, that's fine, but document your decision, show that accountability um, for, for your decision not to have one. So if in the unlikely scenario that the, the regulator um, does challenge you on it, then you can say, well, look, we thought about it, we undertook risk assessments, and we understood that although we, we might not need one, we, you know, we decided not to, but we've got these safeguards in place instead, the, and, and these measures too. So that accountability thing is key. The regulator shouldn't be looked at as, as you know, the big bad wolf. They are there to help, and there are some fantastic guidance coming from the ICO on on what the education sector should do. Um, the ICO for Organisations Education link that you can see there, the second link, has got a great video for the Department of Education, and um, I recommend that you take a look at that as well. Keep an eye on the regulator uh, and what they're saying too. That the FAQs that they've just um, released is uh, fairly fairly new, um, so have a look at that, see what they say, contact them if you, if you're not sure. You know they're open, they want to help organisations as well. So um, yeah, not to be seen as a big bad wolf. They are fundamentally there to protect individuals. So. That's it. I appreciate I talked very quickly. There's a lot of information to get through. Um, I could spend a whole day on six principles alone, um, but hopefully that's given you a good idea of, of what the what challenges are facing the educational sector and, and what we've picked out through our experience of dealing uh, with organisations in education to um, to try and help you achieve your your scope for GDPR compliance. Um, there's a, been a few questions come in, so I'm going to read them out. Um, one of the ones, a DPO can't be a member of IT, really, um, and, and yeah, unfortunately, because IT have that, that conflict of interest um, of, of implementing and deploying processing systems, um, it, yeah, it's considered to be a conflict of interest if your, your IT manager is, is also the data protection officer. And there was a, um, an organization in Europe who had been fined recently because their IT manager was their data protection officer. They were only fined because the regulator told them that it wasn't valid, that they did have that conflict of interest, and they chose to ignore them. Um, and so the, the regulator said, well, look, if you're going to ignore us, then we're going to fine you. Um, and that's what happened there. So they very much have to sit in isolation um, in, that, in that compliance role. If there's a data breach, um, is it up to IT to report the breach to the data protection officer within a specified time so they can appropriately report the breach to the ICO? Very good question. So data breaches, you know, looking back at that security element, um, are, are you know, what data protection regulation is designed to prevent, but there is an understanding that they might happen, um, and if they do happen, then we need to be prepared for them. Now, does the IT manager, does, or does IT need to report the breach to the data protection officer? Well, yeah, potentially, if the breach comes from, from the IT department or an IT processing system, um, but data breaches can exist in a number of different ways. You know, what if a, a physical file is, is lost or destroyed? Um, whose responsibility is it to, to notify the data protection officer then? Really, breach notification and breach reporting is everybody's responsibility. Um, if you know, it might be a, a a member of staff that's not in IT or not in uh, you know a teacher potentially, or even a pupil that identifies a data breach, um, and they they'll need to know the appropriate reporting path to to escalate that breach. Because um, going to the question of um, within a specific time, well, there's no specific time to report data breaches to your data protection officer, but data breaches that are likely to result in a significant um, impact to the rights and freedoms of, of data subjects will need to be reported to the regulator um, within 72 hours of you becoming aware of the breach. 
Okay, so that 72-hour window starts from the moment you're aware. So again, if a teacher is aware of a data breach, um, that counts as your moment of awareness. And it was up for them to act on that quickly and report that um, to the, the, the members of your team that you identify as being important in the, in the data breach response uh, procedure. And then it's up for them to decide whether the breach is likely to, to to cause significant uh, damages to uh, a data subject and then report that to the regulator. Um, so, yep, depends where your breach occurs from, uh, depends what the nature of the breach is. The ICO, the regulator, will need to be aware of any data breaches that are likely to pose a significant risk to individuals within that 72-hour window. Hopefully that helps. I think that emphasizes the, the importance and, and the need for having a, a clear data breach reporting policy um, and, and creating a data breach register. And data breach registers are, are useful because they record any type of, of data breach, no matter how small. Um, demonstrate your accountability and you can have criteria for in that data breach register for determining whether the, or not the data breach needs to be escalated to the, the regulator at all. Um, you know, we might consider losing a laptop as a lost asset and that technology asset there, but what about the information assets that that contains? You know, does, the, does losing that laptop mean that we've lost personal data as well as a, 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 an asset to the business as well? And that's what a data breach register should help you define. I recommend creating one of those if you don't already have one. Um, just looking through the Q&A, nothing more come in. I mean, this is your chance. We've got about six, seven, we've got it until quarter past. So if you've got a question that is, uh, you've been dying to know the answer to, then, then absolutely um, feel free to, to throw it in there and we can give it a few minutes as well. Um, ultimately, as I said at the beginning, myself and my role with uh, CyberCrowd and our, and our work with Softcat is to, to help organizations be compliant um, with this regulation, demonstrate that accountability um, for, for, the, um, for the regulation. Yes. Joseph, we've had some questions come through on the chat function. Great. Um, mm -mm, let me just have a look through those. All right, GDPR specifies that data can only be kept for as long as necessary. In education, we have to retain student data for a defined period of time. Is there a conflict here with GDPR, or is that defined period the effective time we keep data? So really good question. Um, we have to keep data for as long as necessary. And if you've got a defined compliance obligation through another regulation to store data for a certain amount of time, then that's the amount of time you should store it for. Um, the, your, you should match your attention schedule to any existing compliance obligations you have. So look for those regulations, look at where you have to store data and, and understand the compliance and then attribute your retention schedules to that. Um, you can't break one leg legislation in order to be a compliant with another one. So um, we have to be compliant with all. Uh, so hopefully that answers that question. Who in the school should be involved with GDPR compliance working group? Well, it was a really good question. I've often found that the best working groups are formed of uh, senior, senior level staff um, because GDPR and data protection initiatives often require senior management buy-in. And if they're in that process from the very start, it's very easy or it's easier to, to get that buy-in, to get that approval to say, well, look, you know, we need to look at this system, this technology, this security, develop this process, policy, whatever it could be. Uh, and if it's made up of senior staff, then, then that just makes that process that little bit easier. Um, not to say that non-members of senior staff can't be part of those working groups. Um, you, any interested party really could, could be a part of a working group. So whether it's, you know, um, IT technicians, teachers, um, guardians of some description, then, then the choice is yours really. Um, but I'd say at least have have some representatives of, of senior management in there, um, but ultimately you want people that will, that will drive your initiatives and, and take them forward. So um, you you'll probably know who those people are in your organisation. Try and pinpoint them and and see if they'll be interested in 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 helping you achieve compliance with this this regulation and the the other regulations that are coming into play as well. Now the UK has announced the UK Data Protection Bill, uh, and that will be coming into force um, in the near future. Uh, next question in the chat, excuse me, I was looking at the Q&A, so we've got questions come through here in the chat. Can we use Microsoft GDPR toolkits 
as a guideline and starting point to yeah, SS systems and data in our firm. Uh, absolutely. No, no reason, no reason against that. You know, if, my, if Microsoft have that GDPR tool, um, then then yeah, why not use it? Because the you, you have to look at what you've got, and if you are a Microsoft house, a Microsoft organisation, and they are saying yes, we've got a tool that will help you with compliance, then fantastic. It might be more of a risk not to do that. So any tool that you already have from any vendor, any party that is associated with you, um, do utilize and, and it will help you understand your scope, understanding your risks in a, in, in a, in a, in a greater detail. Um, have a look at its capabilities, but also have a look at where it's, um, it might fall down and not provide you with, with that total coverage. You know, for your systems that aren't Microsoft based, it might be more beneficial um, to go down another route, whether, whether that's someone pouring through data themselves or, or looking at another tool. So um, yes, I absolutely use all the tools available, um, be aware of their limitations and, and be able to, to, to account for those and, and, and get around them if needs be. Um, okay, just a few more questions coming through the Q&A. Bear with me while I have a read through. Oh, quite a few questions come through. So. Mm -mm. Did I hear correctly the head of finance uh, cannot be the DPO? If the head of finance has got a, a conflict of interest with the processing of personal data, um, then then sadly not, no. So you know, if you do uh, in-house payroll, for example, they'll be processing the, the personal data of staff. So that could represent a conflict of interest. Um, again, take that risk-based approach. If it's if you know your finance person, you believe they're the best person to do the job, um, then, then then consider it. Document your decision. Demonstrate that accountability. Um, also, believe the regulator and might advise against it. Um, just try and avoid that conflict of interest as much as you can. Uh, is there a directive or standardization of how deep IT should monitor activities? Um, no, not really. We can look at security um, frameworks, um, things that come out of you know the, the National Cyber Security Center's 10 steps, um, NIST, uh, we are a, 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 um, a security institution, um, ISO 27001, Cyber Essentials. You know, those are all frameworks that we can use to, to look at um, security in, uh, and the data within our organization. But what you're going to struggle to find is a, a GDPR compliance standard of technology. Um, that's, that doesn't really exist yet. There's no certification mechanisms for um, technology vendors at the moment. So um, how deep? you go is, is depending on, on what you determine is, is, is relevant, what you determine is sufficient. How long should we keep CCTV footage for? One week, one month, six months? Um, well, we keep data for as long as necessary. Um, as far as I'm aware, I haven't seen a compliance requirement to have uh, a retention period around uh, CCTV. Um, a lot of what I'm seeing in education is 30 days and then it overwrites. Um, so again, it's what you feel appropriate. You know, storing uh, video files can be quite expensive sometimes. Um, and again, use of CCTV generally has a CCTV management company sat behind it. So there's a third party data processor in play too. Um, so your, your attention for CCTV should be what you determine to see fit. There's no, from what I, I can see, there's no specific compliance obligations around CCTV. Uh, is it correct that within education safeguarding overrules GDPR? Uh, well, wow, that's a fantastic question. So, you education institutions have an obligation to safeguard their their, their pupils. Um, will will processing their data in violation of the GDPR make your safeguarding um, processes more compliant, less compliant? Difficult to say very difficult to say. It's very um, subjective and situational based. Uh, I would not w want to say that every time ed education safeguarding overrules GDPR, um, but your obligation is to, to, to your students. So um, consider that vital interest element of, of the GDPR, that vital interest lawful basis. You know, bear in mind that often pupils, particularly in, in schools that operate at that lower age bracket, are vulnerable in society. Um, you might want to take the decision that, that yes, in some occasions, safeguarding does does overall the GDPR. But um, I would very much take that risk-based approach and look at the, the, the data, look at the individual, look at the situation, and, and determine that for yourselves. 
Uh, GDPR certification, I appreciate we were right at the end um, of, of our time limit. GDPR certification, question coming in. There's, there are a lot of companies offering training, but which body is providing uh, validation and certification alignment? Um, very, very good question. Currently, um, there are no organizations that ha can, can certify to a GDPR standard. Um, so it's very difficult to, to find a, um, a, an organization that has been approved by the ICO, by the Article 29 Working Party and other European institutions that can say, yeah, you are you're GDPR certified. So um, there's, no, um, there's no harm in, in, in learning and, and improving your knowledge of, of, of GDPR. You know, there's an absolute value in that. Um, certified training generally comes into your know, certificate of attendance or, or or they might make you to pass go get you to pass the test which they uh, determine gives you gives you an award or certificate. Um keep an eye on that though because the regulator I know is, is looking at certification mechanisms. Um they will generally be approved from the ICO themselves or or an organization like UCAS. Um Final question, and I'll finish off. Uh, will, Ofsted, will Ofsted ask to see documents to confirm we are compliant? As far as I know, um, the uh, Ofsted don't uh, audit against GDPR as such, but there are data protection considerations. Will they ask to see documents in the future? Um, potentially, potentially. Uh, the data protection is very much in a state of flux at the moment, and if they, if they don't ask for it now, um, I'm sure they will in the future. Um, so unfortunately, we, we are out of time, um, but I'd like to thank everybody for listening to me, first of all, um, and, and attending this webinar. Um, hopefully, it's been interesting and, and you've got a lot out of it. If we didn't manage to cover your questions, I'd highly recommend you get in touch with um, the team at Softcat, who can either set up a, a more of a, an intimate call with either myself or, or, or one of the other consultants in, in CyberCrowd, um, or, or, or help you further if you're looking at any specific te technologies.